And a very warm welcome indeed for Ernesto Cerrone. Please, big hand. Thank you. Well, I have no slides. <laughs> but I have a story to tell you. Um, everything I do and everything I do professionally, my life has been shaped by seven years of work as a young man in Africa. From 1971 to 1977, I look young, but I'm not. <laughs> I worked in Zambia, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Algeria, Somalia, in projects of technical cooperation with African countries. I worked for an Italian NGO. And every single project that we set up in Africa failed. And I was distraught. I thought, age 21, that we Italians were good people and we were doing good work in Africa. Instead, everything we touched, we killed. <laughs> our first project, talking about food and food systems, our first project, the one that has inspired my first book, Ripples from the Zambezi, was a project where we Italians uh, decided to teach Zambian people how to grow food. So we arrived there with Italian seeds in southern Zambia in this absolutely magnificent valley uh, going down to the Zambezi River, and we taught the local people how to grow Italian tomatoes and zucchini. And and of course, the local people had absolutely no interest in doing that, so we paid them to come and work, and sometimes they would show up. <laughs> and we were amazed that the local people in such fertile valley would not have any agriculture. And, uh, but instead of asking them how come they were not growing anything, we simply said, thank God we're here. <laughs> Just in the nick of time to save the Zambian people from starvation. <laughs> and of course, Everything in Africa grew beautifully, and we had these magnificent tomatoes. In, in Italy, a tomato would grow to this size, in Zambia, to this size. And we could not believe. And we were telling the Zambians, look how easy agriculture is. When the tomatoes were nice and ripe and red, overnight, some 200 hippos came out of the, from the river, and they ate everything. <laughs> and we said to the Zambians, my god, the hippos. And the Zambia said, yes, that's why we have no agriculture here. <laughs> why didn't you tell us? You never asked. <laughs> I thought it was only us Italians blundering around Africa. But then I saw what the Americans were doing, what the English were doing, what the French were doing. And after seeing what they were doing, I became quite proud of our project in Zambia. Because you see, at least we fed the hippos. <laughs> you should see the rubbish. You should see the rubbish that we have bestowed on unsuspecting African people. You want to read the book, read Dead Aid by Dambisa Moyo, Zambian woman economist. The book was published in 2009. We, Western donor country, have given the African continent $2 trillion American in the last 50 years. I'm not going to tell you the damage that the money has done. Just go and read her book. Read, read it from an African woman, the damage that we have done. We, Western people, are imperialist, colonialist, and missionaries. And there are only two ways we deal with people. We either patronize them, or we are paternalistic. The two words come from the Latin root pater, which means father, but they mean two different things. Paternalistic, I treat anybody from a different culture as if they were my children. I love you so much. Patronizing, I treat everybody from another, you know, culture as if they were my servants. That's why the white people in Africa are called Buana, boss. 
I was given a slap in the face reading a book, Small is Beautiful, written by Schumacher, who said, above all in economic development, if people do not wish to be helped, leave them alone. This should be the first principle of aid. The first principle of aid is respect. This morning, the gentleman who opened this conference lay a stick on the floor and said, can we, can you imagine a city that is not neocolonial? I decided when I was 27 years old to only respond to people. And I invented a system called enterprise facilitation where you never initiate anything, you never motivate anybody, but you become a servant of the local passion, the servant of local people who have a dream to become a better person. So what you do, you shut up, you never arrive in a community with any ideas, and you sit with the local people. We don't work from offices. We meet at the cafe, we meet at the pub. We have zero infrastructure. And what we do, we become friends. And we find out what that person wants to do. What is more important, creativity or knowledge? The most important thing is passion. You can give somebody an idea. If that person doesn't want to do it, what are you going to do? So the, in our philosophy, the passion that the person has for her own growth is the most important thing. The passion that the man has for his own personal growth is the most important thing. And then we help them to go and find the knowledge because nobody in the world can succeed alone. There was this wonderful presentation this morning you know, about this uh, uh, innovation center that had been set up, the idea that you need helpers, advisors, people who work with you. That's what we have discovered. We have discovered that the person with the idea may not have the knowledge, but the knowledge is available. So years and years ago, I had this idea, why don't we for once, instead of arriving in a community to tell people what to do, why don't for once listen to them, but not in community meetings? Let me tell you a secret. There is a problem with community meetings. Entrepreneurs never come. <laughs> and they, they never tell you at the, in a public meeting what they want to do with their own money what opportunity they have identified. So planning has this blind spot. The smartest people in your community, you don't even know because they don't come to your public meetings. <laughs> what we do, we work one-on-one. -on -one. And to work one-on-one, -on -one, you have to create a social infrastructure that doesn't exist. You have to create a new profession. The profession is the family doctor of enterprise, the family doctor of business who sits with you in your house, at your kitchen table, at the cafe, and helps you find the resources to transform your passion into a way to make a living. I started this as a tryout in in Esperance, in Western Australia, I was doing a PhD at the time, trying to go away from this patronizing bullshit that we arrive and tell you what to do. And so what I did in Esperance that first year was to just walk the streets. And in, the, in, in three days, I had my first client, and I helped this first guy who was smoking fish from a garage, was a Maori guy. And I helped him to sell to the restaurant in Perth, to get organized. And then the fisherman came to me to say, you the guy who helped Maury, can you help us? And I helped these five fishermen to work together and get this beautiful tuna, not to the cannery in Albany for 60 cents a kilo, but we find a way to take the fish for sushi to Japan. 
for $15 a kilo. And the farmers came to talk to me, say, hey, you help them, can you help us? In a year, I had 27 projects going on, and the government came to see me to say, how can you do that? How can you do that? And I said, I do something very, very, very difficult. I shut up and listen to them. <laughs> so, so the government says, do it again. <laughs> We've done it in 300 communities around the world. We have helped to start 40,000 businesses. There is a new generation of entrepreneurs who are dying of solitude in Christ's church. I want to tell you something. This is very, very serious. Peter Draca, one of the greatest management consultants in history, died aged 96 a few years ago. Peter Draca was a professor of philosophy before becoming involved in business. And this is what Peter Draga says. Planning is actually incompatible with an entrepreneurial society and economy. Planning is the kiss of death of entrepreneurship. So now you're rebuilding Christ Church without knowing what the smartest people in Christ Church want to do with their own money and their own energy. You have to learn how to get these people to come and talk to you. You have to offer them confidentiality, privacy. You have to be fantastic at helping them. And then they will come, and they will come in droves. In a community of 10,000 people, we get 200 clients. Can you imagine in a community of 400,000 people, the intelligence and the passion? Which presentation have you uploaded the most this morning? Local, passionate people. That's who you have uploaded. So, what I'm saying is that entrepreneurship is where it's at. We are at the end of the first industrial revolution, non-renewable fossil fuels, manufacturing, and all of a sudden, we have systems which are not sustainable. The internal combustion engine is not sustainable. Free and way of maintaining things is not sustainable. What we have to look at is at how we feed, cure, educate, transport, you know, communicate for seven billion people in a sustainable way. The technologies do not exist to do that. Who is going to invent the technology for the green revolution? Universities, forget about it. <laughs> Government, forget about it will be entrepreneurs, and they're doing it now. There's a lovely story that I read in a, in a Futurist magazine many, many years ago. It was a group of experts who were invited to discuss the future of the city of New York in 1860. And in 1860, this group of people came together, and they all speculated about what would happen to the city of New York in 100 years. And the conclusion was unanimous. The city of New York would not exist in 100 years. Why? Because they look at the curve and say, if the population keeps growing at this rate, to move the population of New York around, they would have needed six million horses. <laughs> and the manure created by six million horses would be impossible to deal with. <laughs> they were already drowning in manure. <laughs> so 1860, they are seeing this dirty technology that is going to choke the life out of New York. So what happens in 40 years' time, in year 1900, in the United States of America, there were 1,001 car manufacturing companies. 1,001 was the, the idea of funding a different technology had absolutely taken over. And there were tiny, tiny little factories in backwaters Dearborn, Michigan, Henry Ford. However, there is a secret to work with entrepreneurs. First, you have to offer them confidentiality, otherwise they don't come and talk to you. Then you have to talk, uh, offer them absolute dedicated 
in, in passionate service to them. And then you have to tell them the truth about entrepreneurship. The smallest company, the biggest company, has to be capable of doing three things beautifully. The product that you want to sell has to be fantastic. You have to have mar fantastic marketing. And you have had tremendous financial management. Guess what? We have never met a single human being in the world who can make it, sell it, and look after the money. <laughs> Doesn't exist. <laughs> this person has never been born. <laughs> so what we have, this, we've done the research, and we have looked at the 100 iconic companies of the world, Carnegie, Westinghouse, Edison, Ford, all the new companies, Google, Yahoo. There's only one thing that all the successful companies in the world have in common, only one. None was started by one person. Now we teach entrepreneurship to 16 years old in Northumberland, and we start the class by giving them the first two pages of Richard Branson autobiography, and the task of the 16 years old is to underline in the first two pages of Richard Branson autobiography how many times Richard uses the word I and how many times he uses the word we. Never the word I and the word we, 32 times. He wasn't alone when he started. Nobody started a company alone. No one. So we can create a community where we have facilitators sitting in cafes, in bars, in your beautiful uh, um, new mall, container mall. You, we have enterprise facilitators sitting there who come from a small business background and are your dedicated buddies who will go to you what somebody did for this gentleman who talked about you know, this e uh, epic. Somebody who will say to you, what do you need? What can you do? Can you make it? Okay, can you sell it? Can you look after the money? Oh, no, I cannot do this. Would you like me to find you somebody? We activate communities. We have groups of volunteers supporting the enterprise facilitator to help you to find resources and people. And we have discovered that the miracle of the intelligence of local people is such that you can change the culture and the economy of this community just by capturing the passion, the energy, and imagination of your own people. Thank you.